Hello, my friends. Welcome to another episode, Voices of the Revolution podcast. We are so official here with my new friend, Katie Sulaticki. I'm so grateful to welcome you to our weird little revolution family. <laughs> I'm super stoked to be here. <laughs> so you are popping a cherry for me. <laughs> what is, which, which cherry is that? <laughs> So I, every guest that I have had on my podcast has been someone that I know personally, but you and so Katie and I, um, got connected through a mutual friend. And then I've just been crushing on your Instagram for the last couple of months. We've been crushing on each other's Instagrams for the last couple of months. And then with what I've been wrestling with, um, in particular around philosophy, I just had the brilliant idea to invite you to be on the podcast. So thank you so much for popping this cherry for me of working with someone in this capacity who I have never met in the flesh. And we are, we don't even live in the same country. Honestly, Instagram and social media have been great for that, especially during the pandemic, like how interconnected everything really is, even in an online, like virtual space. It's kind of crazy and super super cool it is super it's super cool that it's like you know of course there's nothing that can compare to the in the flesh but that I truly feel like I know you and you know your Instagram we'll we'll give it a good plug later right but it's, yeah so you know and I'll put it in the description or something but like I just I get so much out of your Instagram and I, I feel like I'm in a philosophy class with you uh, that's like the best phrase I could get. So thank you. <laughs> I mean, that's like pretty much what I'm all about is trying to make, you know, philosophy fun and accessible and practical, but like in my own weird way. Yes. Yeah. In the way that it perfectly channels through you. Right. And it's, that is, I'm so happy that you brought that up. That is something that I find about philosophy. So I, I took a couple of philosophy courses in college um, nothing too much to write home about. And as everyone who listens to this know, I was, a, you know, knows I was a terrible student, right? So it, it's not like, you know, um, but I, I find that it's, you know, once you start diving into philosophy, there's so much text and there's so many, you know, there's so much reading and learning, but ultimately really at its essence, and, and you and I were kind of just talking about this before we hit record, really at its essence, philosophy is just a part of life. And there's like this almost separation between like the academia of philosophy and then doesn't get translated in like the everyday person is a philosopher and might not know it. Absolutely. This was like an, a huge issue I had when I was in school. So like I studied philosophy in my undergrad and then in my master's. And that was like, I like being in academia really kind of deluded me because I felt like everyone was in their ivory tower, like wanting to study, you know, like some, like, like I love abstract thought, but some of the stuff that they would study, I just feel like, how are you not translating this to the rest of your life? Or how do you not like, it's like, they would almost get off on the idea that it, like, it's super exclusive and no one else like can have access to like this weird niche corner. Like they, they like, th they like thrived off of like how esoteric and like unintelligible it was. And that's not at all what I'm about, especially because like, if you look at a lot of philosophy, it can fundamentally be applied to life. Like if you look at like Aristotle, like his virtue ethics, which is literally kind of like a blueprint or a map for how to like live a good life. Mm. <laughs> for the everyday person. Yeah. Like that's a lot of philosophy was essentially that. Mm -hmm. Like, sure, there is big like theory abstract ideas with it, but that's not all it is. Mm -hmm. And you can also go through life as a normal, normal person thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. Like I'm always like, I wake up in the morning, you know, get ready for like my actual day job. And I'm like literally making my coffee and thinking about like philosophical things yeah. or like walking my dog and thinking about like phenomenology, which is like the, like the branch of philosophy, which talks about like the structures of reality and being and how we perceive things. And like, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like, how, how is not everyone else just like going through life thinking this stuff? Like, it's just normal. It's like, it's, it's not even second nature. It's just like nature for me to do this. 
Katie, <laughs> you and I are birds of a feather, right? I'm like sitting there drinking. It's like 6.30 in the morning and I'm like, what's a dog, right? And I'm like <laughs> trying to conceptualize the difference between like animals and humans and how, you know, and I totally, yeah, literally, literally. Like, so many times in a day, I'll be like sitting, like doing something at work and then I'll just be like, oh, I'll, I'll trail off for a second and just be like, man, it's so crazy that we're all just like existing right now. Like the fact that we are in existence, like... <laughs> And I'm like, and everyone's just like go like going about their day, just like, oh yeah, this is totally normal and not like fucked up. Yeah. I remember a couple months, maybe years ago, I used to just like whenever I'd go out, you know, drinking or whatever with friends, and I just all of a sudden would say, I would say this all the time, like, you guys, like, how does everyone <laughs> That's the hound dog, right? I think there's a bunny out. We warned each other that our dogs would be barking and it's it's mine. Oh, no worries at all. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, that's enough. He's like, but it's in my nature, mom. Weren't you just talking about like... He's like, you're talking about nature. Like what, like, this is what I do. I'm a hound dog. I bark at bunnies. <laughs> yeah. So I would, how does every, so this is what my question was for a long time. I don't have the answer. How does everyone like put their shoes on in the morning and brush their teeth? And it's like, we're all gonna die. And we're just all okay with this somehow. And don't think about this all the time. So this is one of my favorite things in philosophy. I'm so glad you've brought this up. Um, um, so there's this philosopher I love, Heidegger. And he, so like to back it up a bit, <laughs> one of my favorite areas of philosophy is like metaphysics and death and that kind of stuff. Like the stuff in philosophy that we will never know the answer to, to be fair, can we ever know the answer to any of it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it, it's about like, that's the whole point in philosophy, like pursuing these things that we know that we will never arrive at an answer for, but doing it like in spite of that. It's like about the investigation. <clears throat> and so I guess to like preface it a little bit, my, I always joke that my first existential crisis was when I was about four or five years old and I was like laying in bed at night. Like I'm, I'm not religious now, but like I grew up religious and I remember like laying in bed and like getting really upset thinking about the concept of eternity. Cause like when I was little, I believed like in an afterlife and everything. Mm -hmm. And my mom, and I was like, mom, I'm, I'm like scared. I don't I, like, I'm scared of um, like, you know, an afterlife and everything that happens. And she's like, oh, Katie, well like, you know in heaven, everyone you know and love will be there. It'll be great, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, but I don't want to exist forever. I'm afraid of eternity. <laughs> <laughs> You don't understand what I'm saying, mom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's so, like, to, so to bring it back to like Heidegger, he, he really resonates with me because he wrote a lot about um, death. And he also studied, he, he's one of the few philosophers that he's a Western philosopher, German philosopher. He's dead now, but he was big in like the 20, like, I want to say like the thirties through to like the seventies when he died or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but he's one of the few that did try to kind of bridge the gap between Eastern and Western philosophy, which I think is why it resonates with me, like his views on death, because <laughs> they are different from, you know, like the traditional Western views. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that he, that, that resonated with me so much was how he talks about, he calls it like the they, which is, it's not like an actual group of people. It's think about like the societal expectations and like traditions that are projected onto us, like the things that you grew up that are, you're, you know, like, oh, this is how you're supposed to be, behave. This is how you are supposed to act. These are the things that like, it's okay for you to like, like the socially acceptable things, you know, mm -hmm. like the niceties. And Heidegger's thing is just going a lot, like some of those things might be fine to do. Like, yeah, you know, maybe holding a door open for someone. Yeah, that's like a really nice thing to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but some of these things, like we're not questioning it at all. We're just going through the motions because it's like what we're supposed to do when in actuality we're being like inauthentic and then to go on like that's kind of the baseline but then we add things on to like like big things like death how a lot of people go through life knowing like we know that death is something that happens but we most people don't view it as something that happens to them even though like fundamentally we know we all die but it's like when you go to a funeral it's like oh death happened to someone else or like death happened but it's not like a thing we dwell on it's kind of taboo to talk about like you know you, you go to funerals like I remember my first funeral was my grandpa. He, he passed away at the age of like 86 or 87 from a massive heart attack. And I didn't know, how, like I was sad, but my reaction was to like laugh during the funeral. And of course, like me being, I was like maybe nine, no one, 
you know, it's a taboo topic to like talk about death and everything. So no one goes like, oh, hey, Katie, this is totally like a normal way for you to react. So I just felt like, you know, embarrassed. I'm like, you know, because you're a kid, you don't know what the, <laughs> it's like, I'm sad, but I'm expressing myself like through laughter. And it was through the absurdity of the situation. Like I, I was nine at the funeral and I was just like, this is so absurd. Like all of these people just like, like paying their respect or like gathering around a dead body. And I mean, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm all for our ritualistic, you know, grief mm -hmm. traditions and everything. Like they are fundamentally for people, but we don't act like they are we act like it's you know this like thing that's for the dead even though it's really something for us mm -hmm. but it, it's like this whole complicated weird thing um that we're all or most people are completely avoiding like the topic in general like of talking about death of, of realizing that it's something that happens to us we avoid it we create these um i don't know what the word is like fantasies or like alternatives like not nothing against religion like some people like you know truly believe that but for most of it, it it's just a way to escape the realization of the finitude of our existence the fact that we are going to die so for heidegger it's all about learning to face i mean to put it like in super simplistic terms because he was german and it was translated to english so he the germans love to make words up so it's actually like and philosophy is very dense um, so like in the simplest terms as i can say um, it's, it's essentially like about internalizing and facing death and being like, you know what, I am going to die one day, but that doesn't mean like it, like I'm not going to avoid it. Like, I honestly believe a lot of the anxieties from the human condition that we all experience come from our avoidance of death. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was like a really long rant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I have, I have too much to respond to. Um, I think so much, I love the way that you communicate um, because there is something about working in the academic field that almost does give what you have to share. You know, you can pull from, and that's why we study, you know, people from other times because you can pull from there. Yeah. I, I think for me, one of the things that stood out the most is this concept. If we're thinking about death, and in our culture, it's kind of taboo laughing at funerals, right? It's, it's, we, you know, I talk, you know, our meat comes in plastic, right? We're not, yeah, we're so removed from death, like <laughs> Ooh, right. <laughs> versus other cultures through time and space, right? It's like this great adage of, you know, today is a great day to die. And it's the only, I believe this is like, Sarah Elizabeth Carey personal belief system, right? I personally believe that without having death as an intimate partner in life, we will always have spiritual malaise. And one of my favorite authors um, is this gentleman, Jed McKenna. If you don't know him, put him on your list. Greatest living philosopher of all time, although he doesn't really exist because it's a pen name and you can't find him. And it's like a whole thing. And the cover <laughs> picture on his book is just of a border collie, right? It's like, he's like next level, uh, incredible. But he ends his, so he writes a trilogy, right? Called Spiritual Enlightenment, The Damnedest Thing. And he ends his like, you know, credo, right? Like his, the t entire summation of what he, you know, what he wants to put out into the world. And he ends it by saying, if you are not consciously aware that at every moment you have the choice to kill yourself, you are not a fully integrated human being. And it's, you know, he's just so ruthless. And, you know, and I, oh, there's your puppy. Yeah, there's Lorelai. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, you're fine. You know? <laughs> I love him. What's her name? Lorelai. Like Lorelai Gilmore? It's not, she's not named after the Gilmore Girls, but yes. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> well, mine is Huckleberry, and it is after Huckleberry Finn. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so in our culture, right, suicide is seen as this thing where it's like somebody only commits suicide when they're like deep and depressed and, you know, in, in like as a last resort, when really, if you don't have suicide on the table for your, not that you even have to consciously think about, but to bring it out of your psyche and to put it on the table for yourself, 
I don't think that you're actually doing any spirit of the spiritual work that you think you are. It's super funny you say that because there's this um Albert Camus. I don't know if you're if you're familiar with Camus. Love him. Yeah. Love him. So like he has his I, I think I posted, I think I redid my a video on him like maybe last week about um suicide and absurdity and how he always says like uh, you know, the joke is like, should I kill myself and have a cup of coffee? And how it's like technically killing myself is never it's t it's typically not a legitimate like um like question because we should be like revolting um against you know i guess like our human like the human condition and embracing the absurdity as as much as we can because like our existence is pretty absurd but yes like we should still be contemplating it like that's always <laughs> it's always, I'm always yeah it's always an option it's i like think about it all the time like not in a serious like in a you know in like a pseudo serious thing where sometimes i think i'm like i'm like i could just kill myself right now not that i will or would or want to but it is technically always an option i mean it's sure there might be like human you know our human drive to um like live and everything like that stops us or you know but mm -hmm. technically you can but mm -hmm. that's also where like this concept of um like Camus and Sartre and some of those other like absurdists and existentialists they talk about radical freedom mm. and it's the fact that like technically technically it would be really fucking difficult to you know completely relocate and just my professor always used to say this she's like technically I could quit being a professor and go and move to like a beach in the south pacific and sell seashells mm. down on the seashore she's like there's technically nothing stopping me she's like if I exercise my radical freedom I could do it but most people like never you know, even consider or think about all of the possibilities and things that they could do if they actually, you know, pushed through or decided to like make that decision and stick with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then that kind of brings us back to the social conditioning that you were mentioning earlier, right? These obligations that, you know, this social conditioning, and then we just sort of get funneled into a life that, and then oh my God. unconsciously, an unconsciously chosen life. Can we talk about that? Can you please talk about yeah. it? So for me, this is a big one too. So like, I, I always say like, and we'll get to the Socrates thing too. Like, I always say like, I don't know anything. Cause yeah, yeah I'm always like, I, I have a good grasp of things. I try to you know, like help, you know, enlighten or shed light on some philosophical knowledge as best as I can. But ultimately like, I don't, you know, I'm not necessarily an expert. Um, <laughs> I'm not, and I'm not just trying to be humble. <laughs> <laughs> but um but even though philosophy is so deeply like ingrained in like my way of life and everything I do sometimes you still forget like you you default back into like the motions of existence which is why I, I say philosophy is also like a practice like even though it's everything for me I also have to like be conscious of it sometimes because sometimes you do fall back into like the I, I call it the everydayness of existence like when you just go through the motions and don't really like you're not actually like there and aware and engaged you're just like letting life happen rather than being part of life um so and so, pilot, auto yeah, pilot. yeah exactly so mm -hmm. i was i was like married for like three years or something i was in a relationship for like <clears throat> eight years and it was around the pandemic where i started to realize like reevaluate what was important to me and like my ex chris super nice guy like we're on good terms still like we have we joke we have shared dog custody like he takes the dog on weekends yeah. <clears throat> um, awesome. so, so like it ended like mutually and on good terms yeah. um but I, one day I realized like I had this like feeling in the pit of my stomach for a while I was like I'm unhappy like I didn't I was scared to like address it or say anything I and it wasn't I had this really stupid idea in my head I was like oh well this is what's expected of me I made this choice I have to like commit to it I have to take responsibility for my actions my happiness isn't as important as like the happiness of all of my family like all of these bullshit mm -hmm. answers which is like <laughs> which is like no you are the only person who's going to advocate for yourself for your life for your happiness and you should be treating yourself as an end in itself rather than a means mm -hmm. and i was treating myself as a means like thinking everyone else was like their happiness was more important than mine even like literally my justification to myself was well i'll die eventually anyways i guess i'll just lead an unhappy life and die and then that's fine like what is such a fucking bullshit like way to live mm -hmm. <laughs> and eventually yeah eventually i managed to i was like whoa katie like what the hell you never think this like 
I typically don't think this way, but sometimes I fall into it because I am, I feel like, I don't want to say like natural, I don't know if naturally is the right, the right word, but I typically am more of like a caregiver or like one of those people that wants to like care for everyone else. And like, give, I guess like, yeah, I don't want to like talk myself up, but I, I typically, I feel like I'm more like on the selfless side rather than selfish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I just like went way too selfless and not like thinking about what was best for me. Um, but that's like, that's kind of like the, the thing I always come back to now about how yeah, that's a, an, an example of just kind of like going, like realizing, not like critically analyzing or evaluating or being super conscious, like as conscious as you should be about what you're doing. And then one day you're like, oh shit, how did this happen? Mm-hmm. But that's the thing with like radical freedom too, is the, is the fact that <clears throat> I realized I was like, wait, I can still get out of this as long as like, I have the capacity to be like, no, sorry, like I'm out. Like, I'm like, it's not going to be easy. I mean, there's going to be some fallout, but as long as I'm okay to accept that, like, there's nothing stopping me from doing it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. There is nothing stopping you from doing anything. And my, one of my teachers used to frequently say, if you are not the main character of your own story, like you need to reevaluate everything. And yeah. I love this concept of radical freedom. Um, So radical, I learned this a couple of years ago because I I study radical Christianity. Okay. So radical, okay. Uh, Radical in its root Latin is the same prefix as like a radish. So (laughs) rad. I did not know that. Right. Rad means root. Oh. But when we're talking, when we're saying that something is radical, like radical Christianity or radical freedom or whatever else, we're actually talking about the root, like the root of Christianity or the root of freedom. So that example that your you know, professor would give about there's nothing stopping me from living on the beach and selling seashells, right? <laughs> Sally sold seashells oh, no. on the seashore, I say five times now, right? Um, It's like, unless we have fully brought the possibility that we, and we don't have to live in this state, right? But like to have unearthed it from the subconscious and to sat with it, to have sat with it for long enough to say, I could go live on the beach and sell seashells, (laughs) but I am, now I've made a choice to stay here, not out of someone else's sense of obligation, but because of maybe my sense of obligation and because I want to, or, you know, for what, and and so that's where, when we take it into the super meta, right, of like, if we're talking about suicide and life and death, it's like, that's, I love these like huge meta things, because if I can wrestle my way, if I can like convince myself that I, that okay it's almost like I have to debate against myself if I ask myself the question why not kill myself right now right should I kill myself or have a cup of coffee and then I have to like do the emotional philosophical psychological work to come to a landed grounded point of yeah okay that's an option but I'm not gonna it's like if I (laughs) I'm gonna have a cup of coffee instead And it's like, if I can get there with something so the everything that is life and death, then that is the ultimate radical freedom, right? The freedom of death, right? Is the ultimate non-attachment, right? And so if, if I can get there with my own, I mean, existence, what's that, right? But with, with my own life, identity, Sarah E. Carey here living on planet earth in this simulation, (laughs) if I'm choosing to continue that, now I feel more prepared to make other choices in my life about my habits, right? I'm woefully addicted to cigarettes right now, right? It's like, okay, well, why keep smoking cigarettes? Oh, I don't want to, right? So it's almost, it's harder for me sometimes in Mm. the more mundane Right. But that's why I like these practices, right? Just like yoga and philosophy is a practice to take it with these 
these huge, co- like I, I make this joke pretty often, say it on the podcast all the time. I quite frequently challenge the idea that the earth is round because I don't know what the, I don't know anything with any certainty other than that I am. And so the earth might be, I don't even really care. The point too, it's the exercise. Yeah, it's just like the thought experiment. It's the thoughts. I don't even yeah. care what shape the earth is or if there's an earth or if there's a planet or if there's a solar, I don't care. The point is to be able to not assume anything that is was, the thought experiment. That was always one of my favorite parts of philosophy was taking the stance of devil's advocate um like against because a lot of times it'd be like a philosophy paper and you'd have to like you know either agree like support someone's arguments or like go against and it was like always I can't think of any specific ones offhand but it was always so much fun to try to challenge yourself and be like let's see if I can argue for something that sounds like super ridiculous or like something that's totally against like what I like believe or think and like just to like do the exercise of being like okay can I actually like you know, reframe the way my mind works and like find a way to like try to, you know, justify my claims. (laughs) It's kind of easy to poke holes in it, right? Yeah, and I I feel like it's a skill more people should learn. Not just because, I feel like it helps you be more critical of yourself and like what you think you know, but it also helps me to see the perspectives of others as well and to be like not so attached to like what I believe. Even if someone says something that like really I'm not a fan, like at least you can still kind of find some common ground and like have that discussion instead of like acting out like viscerally you know how some people they're just like oh god no I can't even like talk to you or have this discussion now because it just is so fundamentally against like whatever it is I believe well we ran into that so hardcore in the U.S. you know with Donald Trump and it's like if some- and no one wants to talk about like what like the underlying like reasons or assumptions or like to actually it's just like they just attack and don't actually want to sit down and discuss <laughs> and to be quite frank I it's obviously on both sides of the pendulum but what I saw this past year was um so the people that I know that are Trump supporters are beautiful wonderful people in business, right? Like people who do not practice racism, right? Like they are gorgeous, beautiful people, right? Like they have my stamp of approval. And what I saw was very much the liberal mainstream leftist narrative and so much on my social media feeds were saying, if you support Trump at all, go fuck yourself. And it's interesting, right? Because the, you know, Democratic Party in the US, right, is it sells itself as one of inclusion. <laughs> and what I have found in my conversation, because I always I'm just curious what I'm like, I'm like, I'm not convinced that Donald Trump is anything other than a deep fake actor, right? Like, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm so far removed from the whole thing, right, that I'm like, I'm not attached to any of it. So I'm curious, I'm like, why do you like Donald Trump? Or why do you not like, why do you like Biden? You know, so I'm having these conversations. And what I find is that when I talk with people who like Trump, they have intelligent, wonderful reasons for what they enjoyed about his administration and the ways in which their business, you know, lots of, lots of intelligent reasons. And it's almost like there was just this assumption that if you're a Trump supporter, you're an uneducated idiot. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was not my experience when I, and this is the point, right? When I actually had conversations with people about why they would support Donald Trump, the answers that I always got back were incredibly intelligent and well thought out. And if I can't challenge my own beliefs of reality, if I can't challenge my own structure of reality, how can I actually have empathy for anyone else's experience and put myself in their shoes? That's something that I've like, that been happening with me more like anytime someone asks me something and any anytime I try to like sometimes we have those instincts where like our like our reaction is to like you know lash out or something and I always like stop myself now and I'm like whoa the fact that I'm I have this like reaction I'm like where is that coming from obviously it's like from a place of insecurity so then I'm like okay let's have this conversation then let me like let me question what it is that I'm holding so dear to myself not that I'm I'm not like I'm not into, I don't know, it's not, not necessarily like the non-attachment because I don't think like, I mean, I, I, attachment doesn't have to be completely awful. 
but right. like you but, might want to be attached to your kids right like yeah. that's probably a pretty good idea yeah 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 but I am trying to be like what you know like why do I feel so attached to like this way of thinking or like this idea or whatever um yeah I don't know <laughs> yeah I hear you and it's you know so the the kind of conversation that you and I are having right now are the kinds of conversations that we have with ourselves all day long right and there is like a special breed of people who this is what they do, right? They take something mundane and ordinary like politics, you know, they consider what does it mean to, you know, release all attachments, to have radical freedom. Quick side note, one of my teachers used to always talk about um, basically that it's like in order to have true radical freedom, you have to kill your kids, like in quotes. Because it's like, if you're going to not travel around the world out of some sense of obligation to your children, right? It's like, you have to like shove your kids in the river oh and pretend like they don't exist almost in a way. And, and then have your life adjust to, okay, now I'm going to travel around the world and bring my kids with me. Uh, and that's, I would say like in, um, in, in not objection, but like in response to your teacher, like when it comes to existential radical freedom, it's a big part is responsibility. So it's being free so long as like, being free to make your choices or actions as so long as you are willing to accept the responsibility. So it's like, sure, you can go kill your kids as long as you're willing to accept the responsibility of that. And like, you know. <laughs> and what will happen too, is that if you like, you know, cause again, like it's like, oh, don't kill your children, right? Yeah. Like not the teaching, right? But to, you know, to sort of, to release the obligation of what it means to be a good mother. Hmm. Because if I, shove my kids in the river, let's say I'm choosing not to travel because I have some sense of duty and obligation to my children. If I release that role and then I say, you know, I really want to travel around the world. Now my kids can come with me. They can spend more time with their grant. Like there's a, and now the relationship can actually, that's where the radical freedom mm -hmm. comes in because now mom is healthy and happy following her own, you know, and again, like, you know. And we, that's part of it too, is that like, sure. Like for some people, it may be like they're like, they, they take on the responsibility of doing because they want to, but again, that's their choice. Like if, you know, they're like, you know, I'm okay with sacrificing my, uh, my capacity to travel to like stay here and have kids. But like, that's, you know, again, that's <laughs> or you can have both, right? There's like yeah. option C that it's like, as long as you are like bogged down by like, this is what good mothers do, right? This is what good wives and daughters and nieces do, right? Like they stay in a marriage out of obligation. It's like, there's actually secret option C, which is like co-parent with the dog and still be best friends, right? It's like secret option C, have your kids come with you, right? It's like, yeah kinds it's, of ideas yeah like it's like thinking outside of like those traditional um like structures that we've created and kind of grown up in it's like what but what does it actually mean to be a good mother and then and then it does like make me think about you know people who have like women who have kind of like left their families or what like I feel like now that I'm getting older I can kind of see the other perspective and I have some like sympathy or empathy because like what happens if you were that kind of woman that kind of just you know, this is what you were expected. You know, if you like maybe grew up, like got married in the seventies or eighties or whatever, like you didn't have any prospects. You're like, this is what you do. You go through life, you get married, you have kids and they feel like everything has been taken from them. And they like, I kind of like, I kind of understand now why some of these, <laughs> totally, you know, I feel it the, kind of like, yeah. be like, I'm sorry, but I'm like walking out or because they feel like they've lost themselves because mm -hmm. they feel like none of the d choices or decisions were actually theirs. I feel it for the boomer generation and I'm even seeing it with some of the boomers and my, the, I'm friends with, a, or have a lot of people in my family and friends with a lot of people mm -hmm. who are on the young side of the boomer generation. And they're like, you know, 58 years old now. And they're saying, fuck, like we've still got 10 years to retirement. And they're like, fuck this, you know, it's like that boomer generation oh like, got so blessed. Right. And it's like, we still have it shitty. Right. But Oh it's yeah. Like, Oh my God. No. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm never going to own a house. Like I have <laughs> not like our parents' generation or whatever. It's right. like, even like the boomers mentality is totally different. Like I remember when I told my parents, that was the biggest thing. I was afraid of what my parents would say. And my dad was actually weirdly like cool with it. And he's like, he has this like weird, almost like Buddha type 
response to things where he's like well if i can't control it there's no point in like stressing about it and he's like i can't like so i'm like wow dad you're like weirdly cool with this he's like oh i'm not gonna stress about it this is your decision (laughs) then my mom her response was something like oh well i guess your generation just doesn't know how to handle hardships i'm like excuse me (laughs) maybe it means i value my happiness and like who i am as a person and want to you know like make the most of my life because as far as i'm concerned this is my one chance to be in existence and try to like do all the things i want to do and to put good into the world and to try to like you know be authentically and obnoxiously me Mm -hmm. And there's the generational gap, right? Between you and your mom. And now it's like, you know, I don't know your time frame, but I know your story because it's everyone's story. Since you followed your truth and your soul's truth and you did radical freedom, how your life has, I'm, I know there's been hardships and challenges, but you are such a more authentic version of yourself and you're just thriving and beginning to thrive, right? It's like, it only makes perfect, yeah. you know? Like, I swear, I just like keep getting, like, I mean, And that's part of it too. Like happiness, I feel like people often forget that happiness and fulfillment and all that stuff, it's not a baseline. That is not the baseline of existence. Again, it's like a practice. It's all of these other things and parts of your life and like conscious decisions that we make that like bring us to that. I mean, it's also like you can technically be happy in like the worst situations as well. Like it's it's, sure, it is kind of cliche to say, but like it is part mindset. It's part like all of these other like tiny things that add up. It's part like, like it's all stuff that we can control most of the time at least (laughs) there can be no you cannot oppress the soul right what's a soul who knows right but you you cannot oppress the soul so even in a prison even in a dumpster fire right like you you cannot oppress the soul and that's you know the ultimate freedom and i i think katie there's something to this idea where again, like there's a certain category of people whose destiny it is to ponder in this way. And some people go down the academic route as you have. Some people found their way into, you know, esoteric native studies like myself. They're all the same, you know, it's the same engine that's running and you know, to, to bring it back to the boomers, I was having this conversation with my dad and, uh, and one of my friends at the brewery the other night. And I was like, well, but like, what if the earth, like doing that thought experiment, like what if the earth isn't round? And my dad, like, he wasn't even paying attention. He was talking to one of his buddies and he just overheard me. And he goes, yeah, don't think about that too much. And then goes back to my friend. <laughs> my friend and I were just dying laughing, right? It was just like, so good. Like, yeah, just Sarah, like, don't think about that too much, right? Cause my That's dad- like they're in, yeah. That's like their entire mentality. It's like, like oh, don't worry about it. It's fine. Don't, yeah, don't think about that too much. Sorry. It's like, I'm going to go play golf and run a yeah. marathon, right? I'm just going to do It's like the Wizard of Oz. Like, ah, oh, ignore the man behind the curtain. It's fine. Right. Just- yeah, don't think about that too much. And he has a point, right? And that, so that's the thing, right? Is that if we take it out of the generation, <laughs> is that there are, oh, puppies. <laughs> there are puppies. <laughs> there are individuals who I think are intended in a destiny sort of sense to be more like laborers. All right, enough. <laughs> Laura, lie. Hold on. There's. Is it? Lie, you're fine. No, we have um, like there's upstairs neighbors, and sometimes they like hang out on the porch, or she can hear them, so she gets like upset. Laura, lie, you're fine. She's just going to tell you, like, by the way. (laughs) Yeah, she's just like, I'm being a good guard dog. I'm like, Lorelai, you're not the only, like, we're not the only ones that live here. You're fine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you should be used to this by now. Um, (laughs) So I believe, again, Sarah Elizabeth Carey's personal belief system is that you know, we, there are universalities to all of this, right? We, we all share some, you know, all of this in common, Mm -hmm. but I do think that some people are more intended, like my dad and one of my best friends and a lot of people in my life, it's like, okay, you get up and you work, right? It's like, you get up and you garden, right? Like some people enjoy that stuff and there's totally nothing wrong with that. I sometimes wonder this myself. I'm like, so there's this allegory, um, like Plato's allegory of the cave. Do you know that? And my favorite, yes. Yeah. So I always think this. I'm like, okay, because Plato talks about how like you can't really drag people out of 
the cave like once you've left and like seen like truth or the light or whatever you want to like call it um like once you've been i guess enlightened um you can't really drag people out because they'll all think you're crazy they'll be like no what's wrong with you you're the crazy one and if you do manage to like get so, so i'm like are there some people that just like can you ever actually pull them out are they just like i don't know is this like an ignorance is bliss type thing like are they hardwired to like i i think about this <laughs> and i don't know what the answer is but it, like that was my ex and i don't know if he just couldn't have i think he just didn't understand the point because like i would try to have and this was the big thing like it turned out philosophy was like a huge part of my life which to everyone around me all of my friends were like yeah katie no shit <laughs> to me i was like oh my god i'm just realizing they're like katie what is wrong with you we could have told you this um, and he just was never able to get to the level I could of like wanting to have these like abstract conversations and like even just like the thought experiments or like, you know, question, you know, yeah, like we, these things. He, he couldn't get there. He was never interested. Like he'd let me, you know, like go and do it, but he like couldn't engage. He just didn't care. Like he couldn't get there. Mm -hmm. um, and for him, like he was totally perfectly happy with doing his like he, he worked in landscaping like you know just going out and doing his like physical you know like his gardening and like mm -hmm. <laughs> everything and some people are happy and content doing that mm -hmm. and like I guess there's no like it's just some people's preference yeah yeah and then it's you know some of it too is like speaking the same language so I feel I totally relate to what you're saying and have been in relationships where it's like, we're not speaking the same language, yeah. we don't communicate in the same way. And I do feel really lucky that there are some people in my life who have this, like, I'm going to get up and I'm going to garden. Yeah. Like we do need those people. We need people who, you know, are actually going to go and do things and, and actually enjoy it and derive like enjoyment from it. <laughs> because yeah we can't all just be like thinking about big ideas and trying to what I find is that with those individuals in my life the ones that I've cultivated is that what they are doing is their version of philosophy and then I feel you know the people in my life are the people who are okay I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna mm -hmm. garden and then I'm gonna sit with you and talk with you because I've been baking all day, right? And it's like, it's almost like they're, mm -hmm. it's like people who are more tactile, right? And like in the physical world, what I find is that it's like, you know, one of one of my buddies, he is doing actually ironically landscaping right now. And it's like, as he's like bushwhacking and like moving, it's like he's moving boulders inside himself. Yeah. Right. And then at the end of the day, then it's like, it just opens up these conversations and we both just took different ways of getting there. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, for him, it was through this like tactile, laborious, laborious, physical work, right. It's like moving the yeah. physical boulders. And for me, it's like sitting and pondering and, and talking. And then it crosses over as well. Right. Yeah. We're not. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I do a lot of like the crossover one. I feel like I'll have like I, I took up running like last summer, like just as like a pandemic like hobby and I've actually stuck with it. And it'll be one of those things. I'll have like mini like philosophical epiphanies like while I'm out running or like doing like, you know, like physical stuff. <laughs> totally, totally. It's all connected. It's all interconnected. And the point is exactly what you and I said that we wanted to talk about because the point is about what is, so let me ask you this question, Katie. What is, I'll launch two questions and you can pick okay. it up whenever you want to. What is, because we are all philosophers. Oh, so this is the point, right? We are all philosophers. We are all philosophers by nature, but there are some people like you and me, right? Who are storytellers and communicate in this way. Who's like, and this is our job, right? Just yeah. like we are like, all gardeners and that is your job, right? So yeah. this is our job. And my first question for you, I'll just say in both. What is the role of a philosopher in a healthy society and follow up, right? We can pick this up if it doesn't, however it comes through. How do you see, I already know the answer, the role of the philosopher being valued in this society, right? So 
what is the role of a philosopher in a healthy society and how is it being valued in this? How is the role of a philosopher being valued in this society? So I'll speak a little bit, I guess, from my experience. Um, So like, as you know, like my whole thing is trying to kind of like teach and engage people in philosophy, like on Instagram, like in a digital realm. And it's super funny. So I always think of Instagram as like my uh, like my agora like my digital agora so in ancient Greece um for anyone who doesn't know like an agora is kind of like the public place that you would go to when you'd like have discussions like you know maybe there's also like the market or whatever around but it's like a public place that you could just go you know everyone was just kind of like hanging out there um you could actually like have these types of like discussion and discourse but we don't really have that anymore it's kind of um weird you can't just like go to the park and start you know, especially in like today's world <laughs> and like start like having a conversation with a rando um which is funny that's the thing I used to do in a pre-pandemic world like you know out at the bar with friends I'd love to like okay maybe it's a little provocative but I'd like to I- initiate conversations with people just by outright asking provocative questions like what's your relationship with death or like have you thought about your death recently <laughs> like- my favorite person of all time. <laughs> yes most people were cool with it but every once in a while like I knew going into this like some people get you know kind of like what the fuck is wrong with you you can't ask me that how did I conjure this redhead (laughs) asking about death into my simulation delete yeah Yeah. they're like where the hell did you come from what are you they're like I don't want to talk about this I don't want to think about this stuff (laughs) (laughs) like trying to drag people out of like like um Plato's cave essentially (laughs) Mm-hmm. They do attack a lot of the time. Um, but, oh God, what was I even saying? Oh, we were talking um, about how you would go up to strangers <laughs> um, and how, okay, there used to be like these public watering. Yeah, holes. yeah, <laughs> like the Agora and everything. And you could have these conversations and we don't really have it anymore. So like for our generation, we grew up like with the online um, like avenues, you know, like all like there were forums and like Facebook and MySpace and all that fun stuff. And now like, I've found that Instagram has been a weirdly great platform for that. There's actually this weird um, niche corner of Instagram that has like all of these other people like practicing essentially public philosophy, which is not something that people are necessarily, you hear a ton about like in the real world because people our age aren't really engaging in public philosophy in, you know, traditional forums. (laughs) Um, But I always say like my personal role is, is to essentially facilitate people's philosophical investigation or inquiry. So I think it's Aristotle, I think Heidegger uh, built off of this, but he says that the most important role of philosophy is to question everything. Mm. Um, Everything that we think we know, like question it. Like, again, that, that like not attaching yourself to it, like critically evaluating it and figuring out like, why am I so attached to this? Like what, why, Like, what is this even? What are like the underlying assumptions? What makes this up? Um, And if you ever stop doing that, then you are not correctly engaging in philosophy. (laughs) So he he always, it's, you have to be able to subject yourself and your beliefs to a state of nihilism. So complete, be Mm -hmm. like being, you know, a a skeptic to, to, um, to an extent Um, and being willing to question everything like it, it philosophy has always been about the questioning rather than the answers it's never been you don't enter philosophy expecting to find answers yes that is one of the great things about philosophy is that we can use it for applicable things you know like when it comes to ethics or figuring you know things like that it can be practical we can use those things to help us figure out you know like maybe better ways of like government or like systems of you know this or that we can use it to find like improve or help us like sort out ethical quandaries and like other things that can translate to real life but we will never find like definitive answers they're all just like it's a it's just a work in progress that will never actually be complete because it cannot be I love the way that you're saying that because that is the importance of philosophy and of philosophers is of going the motions of going through the thought experiments, knowing that there is no definitive answer has a function. Yeah. Yeah. And And I was just going to say like, just because we don't, just because 
we will we will never find the answer it doesn't mean we you know flop around on the floor like a fish out of water like oh my god like no we are still in society we still have to like function we still have to you know like figure out you know like the basic logistics of existence <laughs> So it's not like we're saying, oh, well, you know, we can't find an answer to this. So just toss it out. No, it's okay. Well, we can do this, which is like, you know, it works. It's not perfect, but it's something and we're never going to get to perfect. So at least, you know, this is a starting point and, you know, we can improve upon it eventually. Mm -hmm. But like, that was one of the biggest things for me in philosophy is this, this idea of like, and it comes back to death, like the death and rebirth and um, like the cyclical nature of everything destruction is can be fine and dandy but if you are not rebuilding from the ashes from that destruction then your destruction is pointless mm -hmm. sometimes maybe we can get some innovation from that destruction like it's possible you know if everything's destroyed like you know maybe it's we can accelerate some sort of innovation but typically we should never be just blatantly destroying because we don't like what we have mm -hmm. like it's it, and that's like in practice in in philosophy as well like even on the smallest like scale like i remember being in like a professor essentially saying like you know like we'd critique each other's papers like in one of my grad courses we'd all write papers then someone else would like write a critique on it and i'd be like it's fine to critique something but if you are not offering something better in its position then it's better to not like really critique it at all like if you don't have a way to improve it like at least it's <laughs> like we can acknowledge it's not perfect but at least it works at least it even exists, right? Yeah, I, I hear that so clearly, you know, if you're not contributing, um, if you don't have another idea. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like if you're, if you're even like doing something like with friends or something, you know, you're, you're figuring out like a restaurant to go to and no one can like agree. And it's like, and it's like, oh, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. Okay, well, where do you want to go? Oh, I don't know. Well. <laughs> you're not helping the problem right yeah you are the problem yeah <laughs> yeah it is like you have to give us a bone you have to it's like um gosh there's so much katie you know it's like the societies that we live in are far from perfect right but at least if we're just consistently criticizing what exists and not coming to some form of a solution we are not helping and, and yeah. it, you're reminding me of um have you seen one flew over the cuckoo's nest or read yeah. it a long time like a long time ago but yeah basically there's this one scene where jack nicholson's character rp mcmurphy they're locked up in the loony bin and he tries to lift this giant sink to like throw against the window to break it. And this thing is like, it's gotta be like 500 pounds, right? Like maybe that's an exaggeration. It looks that I'm tiny, right? So I'm like, this thing is like 500 pounds. And he tries so hard to lift this thing and he's straining and he's straining and he's straining. And, you know, everyone's laughing at him then. And he turns around and he's like, fuck you, at least I tried, you know? Like, yeah. at least I tried. And it's like, that's kind of, you know, he's angry, right? I love RP McMurphy, right? But that's, that's what I hear you saying, right? It's like, at least, <laughs> excuse me, I hear this from like social workers and people in the education system. Cause I'm like, hi, this whole thing is fucked up. And they're like, but we're trying. And I'm like, oh, I know, oh, I know, oh, I know, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. My solution is to burn it all down, right? Like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you. Like right? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I think that like the structure of, oh, God, I don't know. Cause I feel like I don't know enough on it, but I feel like we just kind of have to do away with our current system in order to build anything that would actually be better because at this point our system is just like so broken that anything like band-aids can only do so much and that's what I mean at some point like we do kind of need to burn things down like you can only just do band-aids for so long Katie it's like I'm at this point in my spiritual journey where I'm like lean into the skid I don't really in terms of my intellectual assessment <laughs> what's happening in our reality, I don't see any other way than complete destruction, right? So there's, like, um, just, yeah, there's, I don't know enough about these topics in philosophy. I think it's more like postmodernism or more like, I don't know if that's what it would fall under. Um, but there's, there's a few like, like fringe philosophies. Like, I think it's like accelerationism, which is the idea where it's like, you just like feed in and really lean into like capitalist, um, like the capitalist lifestyle and way of life in an effort to like accelerate the eventual um, collapse. 
totally or there's what i've kind of decided that i'm i'm more of the um there's this slavo zizek which is he's a public philosopher mm. and he has this tagline i would prefer not to mm. uh which comes from i think it's, it's a herman melville um like short story uh. about this law clerk essentially who he's like really great at his law clerk job and like the lawyer loves him and he's like and then one day he just he start he just starts to do nothing and replies to all of his tasks with I would prefer not to and the point is that he's it's a blanket statement of not wanting to do anything instead of saying I would prefer not to do that which is saying like a specific thing he's just saying no I would prefer not to like just completely like turning everything down mm-hmm. and the the idea behind that is that <laughs> in the society we live in like in the capitalist framework mm. there is a certain amount of of like protesting and like counterculture and stuff that is already built into it so like all of these all of these like protests and things that people try to do to like better like the framework so just postpone they, yeah. it just postpones the fall of it because they're just band-aid solutions because capitalism is like yeah okay we'll play along because that'll you know if it makes you happy because then it gives them like like more time to continue like their capitalist bullshit so the idea of like i would prefer not to is essentially um revolt through i guess like not doing anything and just letting the cat like the machine (laughs) run its course without like you know trying to postpone it because it will eventually, I guess the hope is that it will run itself to the ground and burn down. And then <laughs> hopefully we can have something else come out of it. This whole thing is out of control, right? And it's like, when you're on the ice, right? What do you do? You lean, you lean into it, right? It's like, if your car is spinning out of control, the last thing that you do is move the steering wheel, right? You just float, you know, to the yeah. back of the road and you try to make the destruction as least dramatic as possible right and it's like the harder that you hold on and whatever it makes it more dramatic and you know (laughs) so what i love about how you shared katie is like i feel like this sentence or idea is clearer for me than it ever has been about the function of philosophy and the function of a philosopher is to have the thought experiments so that then we can contribute to things like ethics, like the justice system, like how we, you know, are going to lean into the skin and let this whole thing, how we can maybe survive that, you know, and, you know, that these philosophical musings actually hold a very integral function in a healthy society. But as we have talked about, that role is we don't see so if there's like a panel on cnn or fox news yeah, or- you're never going to see a philosopher there like maybe on some like other highbrow thing or like on i don't know sure like but yeah not like traditionally um at least not in my experience <laughs> no i have cannot imagine bbc yeah. who's calling in a philosophical expert on protests you know or- yeah to have the conversation on the news cycle about just like what we were talking about. Well, okay, our protests, you know, um, preventing and stopping the yeah. inevitable, dec- like that. Yeah. Kind of and it's like, yeah. And it's like, you have some of these people, like there are public philosophers out there, sure. but they're not always like heard by, you know, like the average person. Cause the people who are interested in public philosophy are people who are already like into that. Maybe they're academics. Maybe they're like, I don't know, in probably academics or people. <laughs> But what I want to do, like, I think there's, there's the value in trying to engage, like find, trying to engage like the everyday person as well. Like not all of them are going to be interested, but there are a lot of people who are interested, who feel displaced, who want to engage in this and don't know where to go, who don't have the means to study this like academically or who don't have, who are are just like overwhelmed and don't know where to begin. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's Mm -hmm. philosophy is just so inaccessible and undervalued for like how practical and applicable it can be it's almost like and i was thinking about this earlier in our episode it's it's almost like philosophy is a luxury right for the individual in the ivory tower and it's like philosophy is for everyone this is literally like i think i wrote about this in a paper in undergrad once um it's like philosophy as yeah, it, there's people who've written about how philosophy was essentially an activity of leisure because it like back then, you know, all of the flaw and even now people who've been able to engage in philosophy are, let's be real, they were um, well off white guys. 
so even in my experience like it was also like a very male centric old boys club like if we want to i'll save i'll save the um topic of like academic toxicity and like for another time if you ever like want me back yeah we do, <laughs> we do want you back if you want to talk about that yeah we do <laughs> but yeah like traditionally um it was well off white dudes or guys or people in the church right who like they were like this was essentially their job or like their family had the means to like send them to school to study this it was it has never been like the average person's um like career path Mm -hmm. it's never been like even socrates everyone like people would be like oh socrates was just like a home socrates was not homeless i'm pretty sure like he he had some slaves he had a wife he had kids he had a house he had enough of what he had enough stuff that he didn't have to have a job he could just spend all of his time wandering athens just engaging people in discourse who it's like if you are a single mother of three children living in the project you don't really have the same lifestyle but at the same token every child is a philosopher what do kids do that's all all kids do is ask questions yeah why this why that like i had my first existential crisis at like five i'm sure i'm sure like millions of other kids have you know oh my god (laughs) i remember i was probably about seven years old and i my dad was like putting me to sleep and i was like how do i know that the color red that (laughs) i see isn't blue to you (laughs) right it was like my first time like he didn't I don't think he really even understood but just like your mom didn't you didn't really fully understand because I was because there is no way for me to know it's like your perception is your perception even if you like had insight into his perception it would still be your perception of his perception like (laughs) there's no there is no way there is no way and there's no and again this is what comes back to like philosophy is not a practice of having answers what my friend sarah corman who you also know she and i joke all the time because she is also a philosopher Mm -hmm. we always say you know we are really good at identifying we call it clues right like oh a clue right like a new clue right like oh a clue right and then we say we're really good at identifying clues but also realizing that the clues go nowhere. <laughs> we, but we also yeah, know yeah. that. So we're like, okay, we're doing great, right? We know, we are seeing so many clues and we also know they mean nothing. <laughs> but yeah, I think, um, you know, is there anything that you would want to add, Katie, you know, just to sort of like put some cherries on top of our conversation here today? You know, I think this is a wonderful introduction for you into the community, but is there any, I'm trying to think if there's, yeah, we hit everything here. Um, and I really am glad that we talked about like philosophy is not a luxury activity. It's, yeah, it's it should not, not be. No. And that's like, again, what I'm all about. It's like, all I, I guess I just want to leave everyone with that. Just start being aware of your existence. Start being like critical of, or just like conscious of how you're living life. Like thinking about are you living for yourself? Are you, are your choices your own? Are they influenced by like the expectations and traditions that were like put on to you? And like, not even that, like start thinking, start asking yourself more like philosophical questions, start the journey and the inquiry, the investigation. It's never too late. Um, just, and be aware of your own death too. <laughs> To start having like different find people who are open to having like these weird difficult conversations like they exist out there and I know that there are a lot of people who feel displaced because they have all these big questions and things that they want to talk about but people in their family and just like aren't open to it but once you start talking about it and letting yourself like be um oh god what's the word <laughs> like be um immersed surrounded yeah, yeah, I guess like be immersed in it or like allow yourself to be um, like put yourself out there. Yeah. Like then you kind of signal to those others that it's like that it's okay to do it. It's okay to be like, you know, show a little like fragility or be a little like, you know, intellectually naked or whatever you want to call it. What I hear you saying is that it's okay and <laughs> incredibly healthy. Yes to re-examine 
everything you think. Yeah. Of. And I won't, I'll leave this for like another time, but like, I think it's, um, I can't remember if it's like Socrates or Plato or Aristotle, but there's a very famous quote. You can like anyone listening can like go look up, but it's the unexamined life is not worth living. Uh-huh. I think it's like, maybe, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, um, <laughs> there's Walt Whitman is one of my favorite philosophers. And he says, um, re-examine everything you've been told, dismiss anything that insults your soul. My oh, friend God. Katie, let's give, give you, give yourself a plug. How do we, how do we find you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I am on Instagram at Katie Sula exists. Um, that's like with periods in between. Um, and I post, I post a lot of fun philosophy content, just trying to make it more accessible and practical and applicable and help people kind of like, um, break down difficult concepts and just give them a place to start exploring philosophy um, at their own pace. I will tell you guys, like Katie's Instagram is super fun. I watch, I don't watch many stories, but like I watch your story every day, right? <laughs> like it's your Instagram is like a highlight in my life. So 10 out of 10, out of 10 would recommend. I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> I think we I'll, did it. Yeah. What? No, I was just going to say, all I want to do is help people embrace the absurdity of existence and have some fun. Like you guys are here, like feel everything. Just like be, it's not that hard. No, it's crazy. Right. It's like, oh my God, like I'm awake. What I did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can keep talking to you forever, Katie. Thank you so much. What a wonderful, thank you for popping this cherry for me. And we'll have you back as soon as possible. Amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye. Bye.